Hugh Siegel has been thinking about Canadian politics and public policy for decades, and his accomplishments are many. He was Chief of Staff to Ontario's 18th Premier and Canada's 18th Prime Minister. That's Bill Davis and Brian Mulroney, if you're keeping score. During his years in the Senate, he was Chair of the Standing Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade and the Special Senate Committee on Anti-Terrorism. Now, as the Master at Massey College, He's brought his considerable experience and insight to a new book about Canada's role in the world. It's called Two Freedoms, Canada's Global Future, and Hugh Siegel joins us now here at TVO. Great to see you again. Good to be here. It's an interesting choice to take on Franklin Roosevelt, but you do, and I want to start right there. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this quote up. For Mr. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you write, freedom from fear and freedom from want were numbers four and three on his list of the most important freedoms behind freedom of speech and expression and freedom of religion. The evidence of the foundational role of freedom from fear and want as the basis for all others is simply too pervasive and conclusive to allow any other freedom a higher status. There is a hierarchy of freedoms. Not all spaces between the lines of the concentric circle of freedom have equal width and depth. That is why the freedoms that matter most and whose protection should be central to Canadian foreign policy are the freedom from fear and freedom from want. Let's explore this. Did you always think these were the two most important freedoms in your life? It was a conclusion that I came to over time when I had the chance to work on foreign policy and defense issues, travel the world as the government special envoy on the Commonwealth, go to troubled places like Sri Lanka, various parts of Africa, and it became clear to me that the poorest countries were also the ones that were the most violent and the places where there was most violence and where people were most fearful were also the most poor, and that the two connected. And when you think about how you structure a foreign policy, you can do it with thousands of little micro-priorities all around the world, all of which are underfunded and about which you can't do much. Or you could say, you know what, there are two core priorities which should define how we advance our foreign policy, how we spend our development money, how we deploy our military capacity, and I believe sincerely, and I try to make the case as best I can in the book, that these two core freedoms, from fear and from want, are central to all the things Canadians want from a world of stability and opportunity and democracy. Would you agree it's unusual for a conservative not to have freedom of speech, freedom of religion at the top of a list, and therefore you're a bit unusual in that regard? Well, simply because those freedoms of religion and of speech and of the press and all that stuff are dependent upon freedom from fear and freedom from want. If you live in a country where you are not free to be a journalist because you're fearful that the government will arrest you, or you're not free to send your kids to school without thinking about them being blown up in a school bus on the way home, the other freedoms tend to dissipate because you can't live without fear and you can't live without want. You have to have some protection from those issues and that's why I thought that those are actually the foundational freedoms upon which all the others are built. So, the others are important, mm -hmm. but without those two basic freedoms, you can't ever have the others. So as you look at Canadian foreign policy today, how well do you think we do at putting the focus on those two freedoms? I would say we don't do as well as we might. We do better in some parts of the world than others. Um, when we deploy as part of NATO in a place like Bosnia to keep innocent people from being killed by the militias, we are actually deploying in defense of freedom from fear. And when we deploy development aid in various parts of the world, as we did in Ceylon, back in the 1960s, the Colombo Plan, now Sri Lanka. Mm. The, we, we gave them 12 engines so they could move their stuff around the country. Ten of them are still working. That was a, a Mike Pearson idea, a good one, about deploying to help people overcome poverty. Some parts of the world, we've done a very good job. Other parts of the world, we get dissipated in other priorities, which don't have any impact and don't really connect to the underlying values, which I think Canadians believe every human being has the right to live with, whether they are Muslim or Christian or Jewish, whether they have no religion, whether they live in Asia or Europe or Africa, everybody has the right to those core, those core freedoms, and our foreign policy should be addressing that much more directly than it does now. I know you'd like to see those expand into the world and, and sort of be captured uh, by the Western nations of the world in particular. How well do you think that's happening right now? I think, what we, what, I think we're going through a very difficult period in global affairs where there's a whole bunch of new instabilities which are affecting government's capacity to plan. Now, I would say, and this will set me apart from many Canadians, freedom from fear should have said to us that when the red line was crossed by Saddam on chemical weapons, 
that was a time for those of us who believe in freedom from fear to engage militarily to bring down his administration. You're talking to Saddam or, or Assad, Assad in Syria? Assad, I'm sorry, Assad, Assad in thank Syria. Thank you, Assad okay. in Syria. I apologize, Assad in Syria. Why? Because he was using fear to kill his own people with barrel bombs and artillery and aircraft in the sky. And when we stood back and said, you know what, he can do that with impunity. We don't have to, well, that produced, amongst other things, this massive tide of immigrants, refugees, who knew they couldn't possibly live safely in their own country. That is now destabilizing parts of Europe and other parts of the world because people don't quite know how to deal with that kind of massive tide. So there's a price to pay by not sticking with the priorities of saying that is one step too far in terms of destroying people's freedom from fear. That was a mistake that I think President Obama made in the best of faith, but it was a mistake, and we're paying the price for it now. You, you know he considers that probably his best foreign policy decision, the fact that America didn't get caught in what he would have seen as another quagmire in the Middle East. Well, and if you look at the 1930s, which led to the uh, horrific fascist and Hitlerian era, which saw 50 million human beings killed, part of what defined that was war weariness from World War I. So people did not want to engage Mr. Hitler when he invaded Czechoslovakia. You don't have to call him Mr. Right. I think um, that, yeah. uh, people did not want to uh, engage him there because people were war weary. So what happened? We had to engage him all around Europe and the Japanese all around Asia and millions of people, civilians, died as a result of the lack of capacity to engage. Hmm. And we are now running into a period where the will to engage has never been weaker and I think it's a huge problem. If we take your argument to its logical extent, does that mean that you are obliging us to militarily overthrow governments all over the world who are oppressing their people? No. Um, it means that this policy would oblige us to have a strategy in every country where we have diplomatic relations to work towards the enhancement of those two freedoms. There'll be a different strategy in different countries. We're not going to go to war with the Chinese because they don't believe in our brand of democracy. But there are things we can do in China through a combination of trade, cultural exchange, working with municipalities and others to encourage the growth of democracy in a constructive way. We can do things in Egypt to help people who are dissenters honorably. We do that in other parts of the world. I think in the famous Israeli-Palestinian problem, we have to look at the income disparity between our Palestinian friends who live in Gaza, who at their best income level earn 1 14th of the average wage across the border in Israel. If Palestinian parents had prospects for their kids, job opportunities, something which gave them a shot at hope, freedom from want, there might be a slightly better context within which to find some lasting peace between those two independent countries. What can Canada do about that? Though? Well, Canada could be directing its investment in terms of uh, development into places like Gaza to actually engage to help economic growth and opportunity. And that would be just as important as any security arrangements we could have with our Israeli allies. But it's in our interest for Palestinians to have a better life. It's our interest for that part of the world to be stabilized because people have economic opportunity and poverty isn't as rampant as it is as we speak. I'm curious as to your view on, and let's now talk about Saddam Hussein and George W. Bush in that war. Do you think part of George W. Bush's calculation in invading Iraq was in fact this number one fear that you have uh, on your list, the freedom from fear? Was that a part of his calculation? I think it was, a, and, and I think the calculation was well intentioned, but here was the problem. And this is where the British are different from our American friends. When the British went in and launched a major invasion in various parts of the world, Victorian England and all the rest, they actually had a plan for what happens after they won. Right? They had a plan for India, imperfect, colonial, in many ways unfair, but they actually helped the economic growth of India as a country, and then when India went for independence, the British stood down over time. The Americans had no plan for the peace in Iraq. They had a plan that was very successful militarily, but they hadn't thought through what happens afterwards. If you are talking about freedom from fear, which is getting rid of the dictator and the person who may constitute a global threat, you also have to think about freedom from want for the people who live in that country who are largely innocent. Hmm. That was not something that the Americans had thought through, and a lot of the divisions and the various different militias that came up and became destabilizing was because there was no plan for average people to get on with their lives in that country. And the Iraqi people are still paying the price for that. Deeply. There is no freedom from want or fear today. And so in that is country. the entire region as yeah. a result of not having engaged on those two priorities. Yeah. Okay, once again, Hugh Siegel, here's you in Two Freedoms writing. 
Freedom from fear also means freedom from official discrimination on the basis of gender, race, creed, color, or sexual orientation. Even more important, in terms of day-to-day -day life, it means no tolerance, official or unofficial, for discriminatory activities that create fear within specific groups. Tolerating hate crimes or violence against minorities is as bad as officially sanctioning such crimes or violence. I want to know how you feel Canada is doing on that test with its indigenous and black Canadians. I actually tell the story in the book of being in uh, Sri Lanka and uh, speaking at a foreign policy institute and I was there as a special envoy from the government of Canada and I was there to talk about rule of law, human rights, um, the need for press freedom, all of which had been seriously oppressed by the Rajapaksa regime after the end of the Civil War. And um, after I finished my very gentle Canadian diplomatic speech, a hand went up and the question was, well, Mr. Siegel, this was the exact quote, you have not dealt with your Red Indian problem for a hundred years, why would we have a solution to the Tamil problem after nine? Hmm. So I said to myself, well, I have a chance here to do the kind of classic diplomatic skate around, or I could maybe try the truth on the <laughs> assumption that I'm never going to be a serious diplomat anyway. So I tried the truth and I said, look, we have a serious problem with our First Nations. We've done some horrific things to their civilization, to their language, to their culture, to their economic prospects. But they have protections in our Constitution. And our First Nations have gone to court on many occasions. And won. And won. And, and I was there six weeks after they had impeached their Chief Justice of the Sri Lankan Supreme Court because she had the temerity to rule a law <laughs> which took away statutory powers and taxing powers from the northern province where the Tamils had a majority, she ruled that that law was ultra virus, unconstitutional, mm -hmm. and they impeached her. And then right. I said, answering the question, we don't call them Red Indians, we call them First Nations, we have a lot of work to do. Some progress has been made. Our Prime Minister stood in the House of Commons and apologized for what happened in the residential schools. Um, but let me be perfectly clear, every time we've lost a case in front of a Canadian court, First Nations have won that case, we've yet to impeach a single judge. Hmm. The whole room went up in flames. The security guy from the Canadian High Commission was worrying about how they're going to get me out safely. The foreign <laughs> minister was, was very, very upset. But gosh darn it, you know, there is a difference. And the difference is, we are not perfect. We have a long way to go on racialized issues in this country. But there is a recognition that we have that problem. People have apologized for things that should not have happened. Mm. None of that happened. I remember when I was in Sri Lanka, the High Commissioner and I went off one night to meet with something called the Tamil Reconciliation Committee in the North. These are deans of law schools and professors and priests and a whole bunch of other people. We had sent the Canadian embassy car with flags flying to the other end of Jaffna so as to pick up a pizza, but so that the minders who were following us from the government would follow that car and not us. High Commissioner and I went off into the deepest, darkest part of Jaffna to meet with these young people, etc. And somebody said, Senator, you've been talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa as a methodology that could be used here to reconcile some of the differences. There's a difference though. In South Africa, people admitted something bad had happened first. You can't have truth and reconciliation until you admit something bad has happened. And the Rajapaksa regime would not admit in any way, shape, or form that something bad had happened at the end of the uh, Tamil Tiger War, if you wish, nine years earlier. And that was the huge difference. Whereas in this, in this country, for all our imperfections and all the work we still have to do, we've at least had the decency to admit in the apologies for the uh, for the schools and other things that something really horrific had happened. Okay, fair enough, but uh, I'm, I'm going to push back a little on this because sure. you do tell a story in the book where you're, and I can't remember where it was, but you're driving somewhere in Canada one night and you get pulled over by the, I think it was in Newfoundland and Labrador. Newfoundland and Labrador, that's right. You get pulled over by the police and, you know, everything goes fine, uh, but I think the conclusion you came to was, you know, isn't it wonderful that we live in a country where we don't have to be fearful that when the police pull us over... In the uh, middle of the night, in the middle of on the night, a dark road... ...that I'm going to end up in jail. Right. And Hugh Siegel, middle-aged white man, came to that conclusion. I'm not sure if you were Hugh Siegel, 25-year-old black man, the same thing would have happened or you would have come to the same conclusion. Is let that a fair point? Let me tell you why the same thing might have happened. Because that RCMP officer who was born in Newfoundland and had worked across the country before he came home happened to be a black RCMP officer in the middle of the night in Newfoundland and Labrador.
So that, that, that says a little something about, however imperfect it may be, who the RCMP is and what they try to do that's right. So that's why I commented the way I did about what an interesting event that was. I don't think you mentioned that in the book. Well, why would I do that? Uh, Wait for you to ask the question. It's much more interesting. <laughs> All right, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Uh, here we go. One more excerpt uh, for our conversation here today. As Prime Minister Brian Mulroney would remind me, this is when you're his chief of staff, remember, Huey, no leader in any country, no president, prime minister, or head of state, wakes up in the morning, turns to his or her spouse, and asks, I wonder what Canada is up to today. It's my job, he said, to scan global events, to see where Canada can be inserted, where I can play a role on Canada's behalf, so that there are IOUs I can use on trade, consular problems, acid rain, or defense that can help Canada. That's Brian Mulroney when he was PM, when you were working for him. And I had that discussion because I was, sent, I was in charge with staff of sending home the legal, the legal bags every night of homework. I'd send home 10 bags a night, eight of which were on foreign policy. Hmm. And I once asked him, I said, Elections aren't won or lost on foreign policy, Prime Minister. What, why is there so much interest in that? And that was his response. That was his, his explanation as to why that was so important. It, it seems to me to be a very uh, smart observation about where we are in the world. I mean, that's obviously true. Are we too so insignificant a country, therefore, to have much of an impact on the world stage today? I think we're a middle power. We have to be realistic about that. We're not one of the great military powers, we're, but that's a strength because we're also not one of the great colonial powers. There's very few countries in the world that fear Canada or have a bad history with Canada. That gives us leverage. That gives us leverage, for example, to be building schools for girls in Afghanistan. That gives us leverage to be working with the Japanese on opening up medical clinics in Afghanistan, which is what happened when our troops were there. That gives us leverage to do things that provides, that is, that, that is afforded a country who people trust because they know our instincts are substantive. My concern is that without proper priorities, by which we focus our expenditures and our activities, we're going to dissipate those chances and not have the impact we should. Does it also mean militarily when we shake our saber, nobody is particularly fussed about it? Well, we're now spending at less than 1% of our gross domestic product. Prime Minister Harper signed an agreement in Wales at the last NATO leaders meeting committing to 2%. It was always at 2% in the Mulroney years. And the notion we'd be spending half of that, in my view, is an abomination because it means that we don't have the capacity to deploy. The new government may not wish to deploy in combat context. It may want to deploy in humanitarian issues, peacekeeping issues, whatever. If you don't have the troops and the capacity and the material with which to deploy, then you are, like we say in the West, big hat, no cattle. Can, no one's going to take you seriously. I hear you, but can, can we do that in an era when we're running uh, deficits now that are going to be in the tens of billions of dollars for as far as the eye can see in order, as the current Prime Minister says, to rebuild the country after the damage done under 10 years of Stephen Harper. Well, I would argue two things. If you look at the fiscal plan of the present government, it assumes a very low measure of growth. And the, a lot of uh, independent uh, observers have said there is some cushion in that which is yet to emerge and will emerge over time. Secondly, I think defense is like all of us you know, we have insurance on our homes, we have life insurance, we have health insurance. Hopefully we never need it. But when you do need it, that's too late in terms of making the expenditure. So we need to have that capacity. Just look at the deployment of Canadian forces in support of people facing natural disasters. Hmm. Look at what had to happen out in Alberta. Look what had to happen in Salmon Arm. Look what had to happen when we had hurricanes in the east. We have to have that capacity for our own domestic purposes, let alone our obligations to NATO and the rest of the civilized world. Let's finish up on this. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau says Canada is back. Is it? It can be. Um, I think the newness of him, his new his personality, the image, which I think is very compelling, is an opportunity to do that. But if we underspend on defense, and if we don't have a foreign policy priority that is achievable, then it won't be Canada's back, it'll be Canada is showing its back to the world. And none of us want that to happen, not even the Prime Minister. But by saying Canada is back suggests that we've been away for the last decade. Do you think well, that's fair? I think it's an overstatement. But every government comes in believing that something it did contributed to its election. The truth is, you normally get elected because your opponents did something really silly in the campaign, badly, and that's why you got elected, because you were a reasonable alternative. But, you know, it's a new government. They deserve some time to sort out their priorities. They're having a defense policy review, a foreign policy review. I think that's all very optimistic. Former Senator Siegel, now Master Siegel, I want you to look at that monitor up there because we're going to show a picture of you and Uncle Max Dankner. <laughs> That's at your book launch at the Monk School of, of uh, Global Affairs at U of T. 
You've dedicated the book to your Uncle Max. Who is he? Um, he is um, a Canadian uh, trooper, Max Dankner, retired, Princess Louise Dragoon Guards, 92 years young, fought his way up the spine of Italy with Canadian forces in World War II. That was before D-Day. They were called the D-Day Dodgers. Badly wounded at Hill 258. Survived, obviously. He's flourishing. And um, the point I make in the book is we can talk about foreign policy. Diplomats can make speeches. Professors can teach. But people from Uncle Max's generation actually put their lives on the line for democracy, which is why I thought the book should be dedicated to him. They totally were the greatest generation, weren't they? They were indeed. They absolutely We owe them were. so very much. Uh, Hugh Siegel, it's always great when you make your visits here to TVO. We love talking with you. Uh, Two Freedoms is the name of your latest contribution to uh, the country's bookstores, Canada's Global Future, uh, with a foreword by Tom Axworthy. So ecumenical, you and he together. <laughs> Thanks for coming into TVO. Thank again. you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.